definition of leadership, but I think that the way we apply those factors of motivating and inspiring an organization absolutely is unique in this domain. And the reason why we struggle today is because we can't get the institution to realize how significantly different it is. So I've spent a lot of time, not only with our own soldiers, our own warrant officers, and our own uh, folks that are operating here, but I've also spent a lot of time with our interagency partners in the IC community. I've spent a lot of time with our, our SOCOM guys and gals that are doing uh, incredible things in the high technology career field, trying to get a understanding of who this workforce is. But I'm not talking about leading soldiers in a high tech environment. I'm talking about leading a high tech workforce. Uh, because Mr. Pontius is here, he's our deputy in Army Cyber Command, and he'll tell you that I'm just as concerned about our civilians as I am about our soldiers, because they are, we are all one team, and we gotta figure out, they're, they're also uh, struggling because we don't understand leadership in this domain, or we don't understand what it takes to lead in a high-tech environment. So the last thing I got to do, is Colonel Pugh in here at all? Right, so, so I can tell stories, and he can't deny them. But, but the last thing I got to do a couple of, uh, couple of weeks ago, I got to go down to Harvard and take place uh, with their executive leader development program. And the, the concept for the program was the intersection of, ta of, of, of technology and policy. So in that group, uh, you know, so I, when I applied, you know, I wrote some essays, sent a resume. I said I was Mr. Harris, uh, and so I fooled them, and I got in. And when I got in the room, I started having second thoughts because we had some of the leaders of industry, their, their, their chief technical officers of major corporations. Uh, we had people from China, Japan, uh, South America, Africa, just it was a global community of some of the most technologically, they call themselves technocrats. Uh, and so I started thinking, well, crap, I may have made a poor decision here. Uh, there were some cybercom guys in there, and Colonel Pugh was in there, so, and I was feeling a little bit intimidated. And then uh, Lieutenant General Tulin came in. He's, he's the MAR-4 PAC uh, commander. And I said, all right, I'm good, never mind. So <laughs> it, was a, it was a great course, but I had the same conversations in the small groups and the projects that we worked with these leaders of industry and technology and asked the same questions that I've been asking across our workforce, interagency and SOCOM world for the last two and a half years. And it all comes down to some basic structure that I believe that they all agree that people don't understand. Nobody wants to talk about it. There's not, if you go down to Barnes and Nobles, you read a book, you go down to the leadership aisle, you see leadership on everything. A different book about leadership on everything. And I've never seen a book that says, here's how to lead in a high tech environment. Here's what it takes because people don't think it's different. So what I did to start with, what I want to do is explain to you what I think talent is. It's not everyone. I want to talk to you about what Jim, uh, Jim Waldo, who is one of, the, one of the technologists that was part of developing the Java platform. He was a part of ARPA when they created the freaking internet. Uh, he's the professor of uh, science, computing, and technology at Harvard now. Really, really competent guy. And he gives a, court, a class at this, at this education course where he describes the technologist. And there was so much of what he said. He has... One of his concepts is if you put more than 180 characters on a slide, a true high technologist won't re even look at it. And we all kind of know that intuitively because you know, they all tweet now and if it's 180 characters, they get it like that. So in his slides, they're all like one word or less on his slides, but he has a great conversation about those words. And then, uh, so I took the words that I thought were unique or interesting, why, it, that, that applied somewhat directly with us, and then I took that, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk through a couple of those with you here. And then at the end, what I want you to do is I want, to, want you to just answer the question about what you think it means to lead in this environment. And then hopefully we'll have some time for questions. Okay, so this was Jim Waldo's uh, technologist look at policy, because the whole course was about policy. So when you're talking about the challenges that we're having, that policy 
is right here resident at Gordon. Some of it's resident at Huachuca. Uh, but it's all about how we're developing this, this MOS, this career field, this capability for the Department of Defense in total, specifically here for the Army. So the first thing he said, tech is not one thing, which if you're talking about just talent, people tell me all the time, hey, I hear we're having a hard time getting talent into the cyber mission force. And I said, well, it depends on what your definition of talent, what are you talking about? They go, you know, that cyber thing, cyber talent. I said, well, there's a, there's a lot of stuff we can call cyber talent. Uh, you know, there's just about any, you, you guys all know that today, anything that anybody can remotely associate with cyber, they call cyber uh, because it's the new, uh, the new word that kind of gets resources. So we got we to gotta take that away and say, really, what is it that we're talking about when we, say, uh, when we say cyber talent? What is it that we're really looking for? So what he said in that same context is it really comes down to software and security specialist, the top 2% in the technology world. In our terms, we call software tool developers, we heard um, um, Mr. Mr. Kroom talk about that today. The most important fundamental thing that we can do is develop a great tool developer. That's talent, that's the cyber talent that we're looking for and they're very, very rare and it's very hard to find. Uh, and then our security, that's what we consider defense. So if you look at the software in terms of offense, which is a problem because that's what we do right now, and then you look at the security specialist in terms of defense, which is a problem, because that's what we do right now, then you can kind of really start talking about what really matters. How, how do we figure out this group of people and keep them on our team? So to, before, before I move off of this, let me just give you, so there's another guy, Tim Willis. Uh, his title is Hacker Philanthropist, and he's the lead uh, security guy for Google Chrome, for their Google Chrome team. So he does a lot of, he's a, he's a very good hacker, uh, if you like the term hacker. But he, he also is the guy that kind of gets everybody that can find a vulnerability in Chrome. He, he harnesses those folks in there. So he gave, he gave a story. He said, when he's talking about policy, he said, the number one th problem we have right now is the people can't think of, of this job that we're doing in anything other than offense and defense. So he said, back in 1993, there's, there was, a, there was a, a program called the, the, the Vastner Arrangement or the Vastner Agreement. And it was uh, 41 nation states, the U.S. being one of those nations, all came together in the little town of Vashner, right outside The Hague. And they, they came to an agreement about arms control, some very tight, strict arms control policy that, that prevented nation states from moving arms back and forth without meeting certain criteria and stringent rules. And then also dual use products. So certain chemicals are good, certain but they can also be bad. Certain metals are good, but they can also be bad. So they all kind of fell into that group. Well, in 2013, they came back and amended that arrangement, and they added malicious software. And what happened when they did that was, so each nation now has to go back and get their congresses and their, to, to be able to enact the laws to still maintain uh, compliance and signed on to the agreement but it almost shut the cybersecurity industry down. All of our software or all of our antivirus uh, companies like you know, Mantech, FireEye, Sem Semantics, all the ones we all know, it almost shut them down. And he said the reason is because when you're talking about code in its, in its pure form, it's the same thing. So if I, have a, if I have a code that will allow me to take advantage of a vulnerability, it's the exact same code that I have to put into the defense to be able to prevent it. So you can't not be able to deliver those code back and forth. So he said, there's where the problem lies anyway, because when you take, take the folks that have to be able to do the defense, what we're calling defense, and we have this debate, I have it daily. The folks that have to do that to maneuver across the, the, the network to be able to test, uh, test penetration or to validate uh, or, or, uh, services on that network or to, um, or to, to uh, prevent or 
find the, the adversary code that's in your network and destroy it, they're doing the same skill that it takes someone to take that code and use it as a tool and deliver it somewhere else. It's the same training, the same skill set that, that does it. The only difference is the intent behind it. So as long as we're having a conversation and debating about what's offense and defense, then we'll continue to struggle to be able to create a viable organization that can have this, this effect that we want for, for the national defense. And I think that's, it's very important and we're not ready to have that conversation yet. But we're trying to do that with our, uh, with our 17 branch. That is the goal, is that one day we'll, we'll have enough folks figure out that you know, we can do both with the same person and then we've got a great, great organization that continue to move forward. Okay, so what he said was this is the top percent. And he's got some really crazy stuff in here that I'm not sure I would agree with, but there's probably a couple of folks in here think it's right. He thinks that that top 2%, those coders that are the top 2%, those security experts that are the top 2%, that he thinks that they're 10 to 100 times more effective than the average coder or the average security person. And, and so I asked him, you know, where's your empirical data? Where's the proof of that? And he said, it's me. So I said, okay. But it turns out that's actually a common, common, uh, common issue or a common concern when you're talking to these folks. Uh, Sergeant Major Willis said they have no personality. Uh, but it, and it was being facetious, but he was actually, it's, I found that to almost be true. And so if we're going to solve this problem, though, we've got, to, we've got to start looking at who it is that we need to be able to get on the team what's offense and what's defense, or are we all talking about operators with a different end state or a different purpose at the end of the day? So he said, these are the people that we gotta, we gotta focus on. These are the people that we're all looking for in industry. These are the people that we're all looking for in the Department of Defense. We're competing for the same people in our interagency partners that our internal uh, services are competing for them. We're competing with each other. We've had some folks that wanted to go to the Navy because they have a better program. We've got some Navy folks now trying to come to us because we got a better program. And that's just crazy. We've got some of the interagency folks emailing all of our operators saying, hey, why do you want to stay in the Army? Come be a civilian. You can turn your hair green if you want and stay with us. So, you know, so we're competing with, with a large audience for this top 2%. These are the people we need. This is talent. It's not everybody. We're all talented to be in this career field, to be in this, this job. You have to have a cognitive capacity to understand, learn, and move. But the percent that we're talking about in that talent that we're looking for to, to really do something special in this domain, we've got to figure out how to lead them if we want to attract them. We're going to attract them, and then we're going to lose them unless we learn how to lead them. So, Technology, again, is at its base root form, has, it, it, it's the answer to most of the questions that we'll have, most of the challenges that we'll have. So a technologist or the technocrats that do this job, they move very fast. They're, the point is what they try to do is launch and iterate, launch and iterate. We heard it said again at, at a conference that me and Mr. Pontius went to a couple of weeks ago. I can't remember even what it was anymore. But his point was in the software gaming world, they launch so fast because they know that the people that are doing the, the, the gaming, they're not going to wait for the best product. They're going to get the first product, and then they use it. So they deploy it even before it's finished, knowing that before that person can get to the level, they'll have it finished and be able to update it. So they launch and iterate, launch and iterate. If it fails, fail, reiterate, re reproduce it. So they move very fast. We don't move very fast in the Department of Defense. We don't move very fast in the Army. Uh, because of the processes we have. We, ha we have this argument with Mr. Pontius all the time. I say, we need this. And he says, I need a requirement. I said, well, there's no, there's no requirement. He said, then you don't get it because the process is built around requirements. So, and I understand that, but it doesn't move fast enough. And if it doesn't move fast enough, the folks that, are, that we're talking about, that top 2%, that top 2% that we call talent that we're trying to find and attract, if they can't see that and they can't move fast, then they're going to change often. They're going to go somewhere else. And we're going to talk about why that happens and what the end state could be if we don't figure out how to get it right. But for them, what he said was they, they think it's okay to be wrong. That's why they launch and iterate, launch and iterate. Let's get a best product out and do it. I have found that not to necessarily be true with our Army cyber folks. That people that I call the top 2%, it's okay for them to be wrong, 
as long as nobody else is right. But they don't like to be wrong unless everybody else is wrong too, then they're okay as long as they're gonna be able to move fast and continue to launch and iterate. So there's a little bit of a difference between them. But they will debate all day long and they love to debate. And I said this to our chief warrant officer corps, it, both in EW and in the intelligence realm, you know, Mr. O'Reilly, Mr. Molenkoff, I'll call them out, are they in here? All right, so I can, I can call them out. But they, they are two of the smartest folks that I know. They've given me the knowledge that I have to be able to even come out and talk to our soldiers. But I, you will never get anything past them without an argument through it. And at first, it frustrated the heck out of me because I'm a command sergeant major. You know, generally, you can say something and people will like go, okay, and just make it happen. But it doesn't happen in this career. In this field, with those folks, it will not happen. And they don't care who you are. They, if it's a PFC that has this skill set and the quality that we're talking about, I've seen them talk to the chief of staff of the Army and not have a time of day for that person because he doesn't understand them. And if he says something that you disagree with, they're going to tell him. So as an institution, we don't understand that. I didn't understand that. It made me angry because I thought leadership in this environment was the same as it was everywhere else I've been. I can go to the motor pool, I can sit down with soldiers, and uh, I can tell them what to do at the end of the day, and they do it. Uh, they don't like meetings, you know, so generally they'll open up a chat window and get anything you need to get done. So to, yesterday, I go down to Fort Gordon, we just brought in our first big group of lieutenants that we, you know, we went out and found the best and brightest lieutenants to become the first 17 alpha officers in the Army. You, know, you lay out their, their, their calendar over the last, um, probably the last couple of weeks that they've been here, and I could count over six hours of people coming in there to tell them what they think. From, you know, from me, actually it wasn't me, it was General Cardone, but from General Cardone to, you know, there are four or five other generals, four or five other sergeant majors, they pull them in and they have a meeting, and they talk to them for an hour and a half, two hours, and the whole time, what those young men and women are thinking is, wow, this is a waste of my time. You know, you could have opened up a chat window and told me what you're trying to tell me, and I can actually get some other stuff done while we're in the process. So, again, it goes back, a perfect example of how we don't understand these folks. We don't understand them, so we don't know how to train them. If we don't know how to train them, we're not going to equip them properly. When we don't equip them properly, we don't lead the organization properly, they're all going to leave because they're very, very marketable. So I had, Sergeant, I had a, a couple of really senior folks that have been doing this for a long time told me, don't worry about it. We don't got to worry about them leaving because they can only do it for the Department of Defense. So, yeah. So you know, Mr. Kroom said that again today, too. He said, well, that used to be true. It's not true anymore. We visited, I have visited a lot of different in, uh, industry organizations that, you know, that are doing this everywhere. They have global rules. They have global responsibilities. Just because you can't do something in the United States doesn't mean they're not doing it somewhere else. And the skill set that we teach these men and women is not just offense. So it's not just attacking somebody. It's using the same skill set. They need this skill set. And it's only going to continue to grow in the skill set that we're talking about, that we want to make innovative things happen for the military, for the Army specifically. It's, it's important. We're not going to keep them if we don't figure out how to lead them. So compromise, again, it's not a word that they like very much because if they didn't think it, then generally it's not true. And it, if it didn't come from their thought process, so the point is I have to just kind of get good at convincing them it's their idea. And what happens is then they go, yeah, that's what I said, and let's move on and do that. Uh, and it's an easy process, and we can get it done. But the point is, the, if you don't understand that, you begin to get angry. And obviously, maybe at some point, you isolate these folks, and then you don't get the sure power of what it is. So to them, some things are just completely easy, and some things are just completely hard. And it's not always exactly what you think. Uh, so, and we don't know that. So what this says is, you know, when a, when a user takes a photo somewhere in an international park, he, he goes to a technologist and he says, uh, you know, can you check and see if that's in a national park? And they say, sure, that's easy. You know, I could pull up the metadata and, you know, give me a couple of minutes and it's a done deal. But if you say, are there any birds in that picture? 
it's going to take me a couple of weeks to get that done because it doesn't, doesn't work in their brain the same way. And, and if you don't believe that's true, then you should go talk to some of the folks that, that we're talking about in this top 2% because they don't think things that we think are just common sense easy. Nothing is easy that I think is supposed to be easy and the things that are supposed to be hard turns out to be that's what they enjoy doing. So it's the only group I've ever been around where, you know, everybody saw in the newspaper and on the news, the Joint Staff Network got shut down. Everybody was very freaked out and stressed out about, especially my headquarters, very stressful time. And, and so four stars are reporting to four stars and four stars reporting to other people around the nation and three stars reporting to four stars. And we had, you know, at one point in time, I think we had three or 400 people between two headquarters working on this problem. So everybody's stressed out, Joint Staff shut down. So I go to visit some of our operators and they're all having a party. Woohoo! <laughs> Joint staff shut down. We get to work. So they're excited about this. You know, so they, they, they're like, hey, Sony got attacked. Let's go do that. So they're, they're all excited about the things that are bad. And the things that are bad for me, they, you know, that, that I think should be easy is just so daggum hard to get them done. So there is a gap between your basic technologist and your high technologist, the true talent that people talk about that we're looking for, that's where the gap is and that's where we got to figure out how to lead in that gap that's going to cause the right folks to want to stay with us. And the folks that aren't the right folks, we got we to be okay with where they're going to go as well. The highly technical folks are the ones that we're really, really looking for. The talent differential between those two is the piece that is easy to manage, but the other ones, the rule breakers, those are the ones that we don't really like anyway. Because generally, the folks that we're talking about in this, this, this skill set, they, they don't do well with rules. Otherwise, they wouldn't be sitting at home, you know, hacking into people's stuff. Because it's not good to do unless you're doing it, you know, for work. So they're not good with authority. You know, I've said it. I, if I sat down, and I could tell you that I sat down when I first got here because people told me, hey, don't worry about it. Leadership is leadership. Just go and you can figure it out. So I sat down with a group of kids and that were in their space working, and I began to try to figure out what it is they do. So my first question is, what do you do? And the kid says, I'm, a, I'm an endpoint exploitation analyst. I said, okay. Uh, what's that? Or at first he said, I'm an EEA. I said, okay, well, what's that? Then he gives me the endpoint exploitation app. I said, okay, what does that do? And I could clearly see that this person was irritated with me. So I moved, went to the next person, had the same conversation, but he said, I'm a DNEA. I said, okay, well, what's a DNEA? He said, it's a digital network exploitation app. I said, okay, what's that guy do? And again, irritated, eyes roll up. And this was his staff sergeant. So I was almost going to you know, rip his head off. But instead, I got up and I walked to the next person. I realized that these people would not talk to me. They don't care who I am. I couldn't understand what they do. They didn't have time for me. And I kind of started get to get that. And that's when I went to search out uh, a couple of our senior chief warrant officers and started helping, getting them to help me understand what it is that these soldiers do. Then before long, I was going back and sharpshooting the warrant officers. Uh, so the curiosity is what drives them. You know, if you give them an obstacle that, um, that we think is something that they're not supposed to be behind, they'll generally want to go figure it out. Uh, they don't like those barriers. They don't like firewalls. They don't like uh, antivirus processes and programs. Uh, but they do like lock picking. And I never realized that, that because I never heard it before until Jim Waldo said that. And I said, man, that's crazy. But he said, you know, the... It, it falls in line with exactly the way their minds think, the, the, the rule breakers, the barriers, the curiosity. And so their hobby, a lot of their hobbies are this poc, you know, the, the lock picking thing. I almost said pick, pickpocket, but that's not what they do. So I said, so I started asking that question now when I go to groups and, I, and, and if, you, if, you, if you're in a group and they all think they're you know, high technologists, these folks, then you just ask a question, who knows how to pick locks around here? And you'd be surprised, a couple of people raise their hands, and then you start talking to them, and you figure out what they do, and it's a very true statement. So it's, it's, not, it's no relevant for us, but it was interesting. I thought I'd tell you about it. Uh, so basically, they don't fit the model that we would generally put in this uniform and stand in front of people. They're just not in that model, and that doesn't help us as senior leaders trying to figure out how to lead the organization when they don't fit the model. 
because we want to have the model says this is how we develop our plans for them. This is how we lead in the army. If you want to get promoted, this is what you have to do. Here's the way you got to look and here's the way you got to act and here's the school you got to go to. It just doesn't fit the model. So that wasn't always the case. Back when technology wasn't so complicated or wasn't so vicious in its end state and its, uh, what we could do with it, we had a lot of technologists and technocrats, and it wasn't that big of a deal. So if they didn't fit our model, then we just went out to the market and said, hey, we can contract this work, and we can bring them in and do the job just as well. And we found out that in order for them to do that, we had to establish research partners, and we have several of them through the the, the, the federally funded research facilities, some of our, our, our academic institutions, some of the high-end industry organizations that are here now. So we, we have those partners, we had those partners, we still have those partners, they're important. But the market began to get smaller. The more advanced the technology gets, the more advanced and the harder it gets to be able to get the people that are in that top 2%, the market gets smaller and smaller. And then we look now, we don't just need research partners, we need folks that will be guaranteed researching the stuff that we want them to research. And that's not necessarily always going to happen. So we need to have those folks, those same folks, not only in the contracting world, but we need to have them in this uniform. So, but the problem when that market gets so small, but we're still contracting it out, we're still requiring it from our partners that are doing that research, then they outsource from the folks that they generally would get to. And when it's outsourced to that point and you're having to find that select group of people because we're not willing to just bring these folks in and figure out how to lead them, uh, there's unintended consequences. And generally, we understand that when those unintended consequences come down, what that happens is it begins to erode the trust of our organizations. Because when you're trying to tell folks that this is how we're going to, we're going to, we're going to organize around this problem set to make sure that we can keep you on the team and you can't do that or whenever you've got the wrong people in the wrong positions because we didn't have the market space to be able to pull in people that just fit our model then we we break down that trust and it's one of the biggest problems we have today even in army cyber is building that trust in in teams which is part of what we consider uh, mission command it's one of the primary responsibilities that we have in Mission Command is building cohesive teams built on mutual trust. So that trust breaks down, what happens? We get somebody like uh, this guy that may not be the right person in the, in the process. And then it just further erodes the trust. Now we have more effort going towards insider threat research and insider threat. We have entire companies that have designed and sprung up just to look for insider threat. So ask yourself, how, how can you buy into an organization that you know already is wondering if you're going you're gonna to cause a national problem for us? It's not, it's not an organization built on trust, and it's the number one principle of mission command. That's what we, that's what we measure across the total army as the number one element of mission command is building cohesive teams based on mutual trust. Do we really trust you if we have to run programs to verify that you're, you're not an insider threat? That's where we are and that's the consequences of failing to understand how to lead this type of an organization. And I believe that we're gonna struggle through this for a little bit because not a lot of people wanna hear that. So my question to you is how do we train soldiers today? If people told me you can come in here and you can apply the leadership that you learned, and that's exactly what I learned, if you can do that, then you can do it anywhere. These are the senior leaders that I'm talking to. These, these are some of the most influential people that, that I've ever met in my life, people that I hold in high esteem because they even had the, the, the desire to ask me this, to come to do this. These are our policymakers outside in TRADOC. There are our policymakers inside in Army Cyber. There are our, our policymakers inside the Department of the Army, inside the Pentagon. These are the people that think leading this type of an organization, this type of person, is the exact same as it is right there. And I would tell you, it's just not. So what do you think of when you think of what is a cyber mission force in the Army? Generally, if I ask people, well, what do you think about when you're talking about talent 
we had the discussion about talent, but if you're talking about Army cyber, what are you talking about? If, if, if I asked you to explain it, and generally, this is the explanation that comes up. Something like this, a picture of this in their mind, you know, some, some geeky kids behind keyboards that are, that are you know, doing uh, cybersecurity or, or information assurance or, or whatever. So, and you know what, that is true. A lot of our organization is doing that. And they're, they're important. They're, they're, the, you know, they're the core and the fundamental basis of who we are. But this is who we see we are and who we want to be. So when people publish in the newspaper, again, senior leaders across the Department of Defense publish in the newspaper, we're having this problem with talent. They don't define what talent is, so therefore they assume everybody is that talent. And they say, well, apparently we're going to have to have a different body fat standard, or we're going to have to have a different haircut standard, or we're going to have to have a different uh, physical fitness standard. And I would tell you that's not the case. And I've never, ever felt that way. I think we have a place on our team for folks that don't meet this standard. Because when we sit down, we've sat down for the last two years, and once a quarter we sit down with the chief of staff of the Army, the Army staff, and we brief them on where we are in the Cyber Mission Force build. And the Cyber Mission for Force build is very, very important. We're building out 41 teams for the Army's piece of the 133. And it's very important because we're talking to members of Congress about what our progress is, where our issues and challenges are. We're talking to the COCOM commanders about who we're supporting and what our challenges are. So we're briefing the Army staff once a quarter. And all of a sudden, General Odenero said a couple of quarters ago, uh, he said, OK, I got it. I, you know, I, you're doing great things for Cybercom. What are you doing for me? And the room fell silent. So we were like, well, I guess we're not doing very much for the Army. Uh, so it became, it became apparent that we need to start figuring out what we're doing for the Army. So the Navy, it turns out, has some really important people doing really great things for Cybercom, but they're also focusing really hard on keeping their ships and boats afloat. And the Air Force has some really great things they're doing, building their teams, but they're also got, they have some folks that are, that are focusing really hard on keeping their, their, their airplanes in the air. But what are we doing for the Army? And that was the question. So we went back and had this conversation internal with the organization. We looked out across the Cyber Protection Brigade in the 780th. And again, we have to break down this barrier about what's offense and defense. We've got to figure out what it is that we can do at the core and below. And I think that most of you in here have heard a lot of the briefs. We've got a couple of pilots. We finished one at JRTC doing some really great things. We've been out with the 75th Ranger Regiment helping try to figure out what it is that we can say this is what we're going to need if we want to be able to do things for the service that are specifically helping commanders on the battlefield at the tactical edge. And I believe that we can do that. If you're going to find innovation in this organization, it's not going to happen in our head headquarters. And it's, you know, it's very rare that you're going to have a colonel or a lieutenant colonel come up with a great innovative idea and drive it in. The people that are going to do that are the staff sergeants and the warrant officers who are actually applying the trade. They're the folks that are going to figure out, well, here's what we could do. I don't know why we're going through this process when we can do it right here. So we have this idea that it takes, and it does, if you're going to do a, a strategic uh, you know, effect, it takes years. It, and you have to have, you know, uh, you know, Mr. Kroom said that today. He said, yeah, you got to start thinking about this five years out if you want this effect at this point in time for the strategic. Maybe that's so. But I don't believe it's so if we want to have tactical capability. You won't like that conversation. Go back to the people that we're talking about. They don't want to hear that because that's not what they believe. That's not the way they were taught. That's not the way they grew up. So a couple of, uh, a couple of great, uh, great things that, that, that came out of uh, uh, some of the discussions I've had recently. One, I read an article by a guy named, I think it was Dan Greer. Uh, he's the CTO for InQtel. Uh, and he came out to, to this Harvard course and gave us a brief. And he said something that was really powerful when I started thinking about all the struggles and the challenges that we're having trying to create this new capability for the, for the Army and how it's impacting our workforce at the same time because of all these, these challenges and, and, and grief. He said high-performing organizations, very, very successful organizations that fail, and we all have heard of, of several of them. You know who they are. It's great that you can't figure out why they just went from being you know, the, the, one of the greatest organizations and boom, they failed. They failed because they didn't remove the people that made them successful to begin with. So the people that made them successful to begin with are the folks that, 
uh, wanted to just stick with that. That's what made us successful. It worked for me. Obviously, it's going to work for us from now on. And those are generally the folks that are your biggest barriers to innovation, biggest barriers to progression. And I found that, and, I, and I'm not trying to make anybody mad, but I found that to be the case in our organization too. Because what happens is if, if you wanted us to take this career field and you wanted us to do great major things for the, for the department, unless something significant changes in the way we think rapidly, then the only way we're going to be successful is if you got rid of all the generals that are any way associated with this career field, you got rid of all the SARM majors that are any way associated with this career field, and you got rid of all the, the chief warrant officer fives that were any way associated with this career field, then we're going to move and we're going to do great things. Because those are the folks, especially the ones that are high technology, those are the folks that will tell you it can't be done. I'm telling you it's against the law. We don't have the authority to do it. We don't have the training. That's absolutely ludicrous. We will not do that. And you'll have these fights until, until we lose the workforce that we're trying to attract and train. That's not going to happen. What happens is if we do get rid of some of the generals, some of the sergeant majors, and some of the chief warrant officers, they come back as DA civilians in the same freaking position. You know? And, and it's important. And I'm not, I'm not being mean, but I'm saying if you don't have the ability to, to get on board, if you don't understand who these people are, embed yourself with them for the last two and a half years, understand what motivates them. If you can't, if you can't quit thinking about what made you successful and think about what is the mission that we're trying to accomplish now, then you're not going to be successful. You're going to be a barrier to the organization. And I think that also applies to some of our senior, senior civilians. That I think it's very fair to say that some of our senior civilians are the same, same way. So we're, we're working hard on that. I'm working hard on that. But I can do it because I'm a SAR major. Yeah, that's, that's why Mike asked me to come up here and talk. He said, you could say things nobody else will say. Uh, so, but it's not necessarily what's going what's to be able, to, and realistically, you're not going to be able to do that. So my hope is that we can convince people to move and change. So let me tell you about the soldier that I, that I spoke to. Uh, so when I first sat down, after I go back six months later of learning and studying it hard, I sit down next to that same kid uh, that was the endpoint analyst, and I asked him, I said, so you're an EEA. How the heck did you get to be an EEA as an E4? So that's generally a master sergeant, sergeant first class, a CW3. It's a senior person that's been doing this, grown up from being a DNEA, gone through the analysis courses, gone through some major, major training, graduated the Cyber 30 and 100 course, and then you're an EEA. And then he starts looking at me. And then I started telling him about, you know, show me the mission, show me what you've done. And he shows me how he's built out, the, built out a network map from one box to over 5,000 boxes globally. And he's like all passionate about it. We had a conversation for two hours about that, just that one kid's job. And then at the end of the conversation, I looked over at him and I said, so you're, you're pretty heavy. Is that why you're still a specialist? He said, yes, our manager it is. I said, so you, you're, he, he told me he's got three kids, just had his last baby Two weeks ago, his wife doesn't work because he has three kids. He's a specialist. She can't make enough money to pay for the health care. He was drawing AIP. His commander stopped his AIP as a sign of incentive pay because he's good. That's why he was getting it. Stopped it because he was on the body fat program. Uh, so that's the difference between having to draw WIC and, and welfare help to feed your kids or not for an E4. But he wasn't willing to tell me that when I first came to him because he wouldn't even talk to me. I didn't understand it. But I said, hey, you know what? I can fix your AIP. I'd fix that in a heartbeat. I can fix that. And I said, and you know what? You're not going to ever get promoted again. So, but you know what? You're an EEA. We've got positions for you on our team. We'll go ahead and separate you from the Army, and we're going to put you in one of these positions. We don't want to lose you. So we separated him from the Army, and we, we set him off, and he was so motivated about being in this, in this organization that he signed a $40,000 bonus and came to work the next day. You know, but you don't get to be a leader for these folks if you don't understand them to begin with. He would have never told me that. I fixed his AIP for his last six months he was in the Army. You won't get that. So you don't get to do basic leader stuff. And that's what I told the lieutenants yesterday. They walk in with instant credibility because they understand that. You know, I talked to, again, institutional barriers. I talked to a master sergeant when I first got here, down in the basement, in the bowels of one of the buildings in the National Capital Region, doing amazing things. And she told me, 
you know, this is what I've done. This is who I am. And I love this to no end. And I said, it's great that you're on our team. She said, well, the Army just QSP'd me. QSP, that's the quality service program where we kick people out if they fail to get promoted or they stay in the same place for too long. So for her job, there is no E9 position. For her job, in order for you to even begin to understand what your role is, it, it takes five years. So we're not going to move you at three years just because you're no longer effective. We need you there for 10 years. So I said, don't worry about that. I'll fix it on my way home on my BlackBerry. That is so easy. And she said, too late. The, uh, when it happened, when the list came out, I told my Sergeant Major, he said, hey, it sucks to be you. Uh, it's an Army process. You just got to live with it. So she went off and got herself a $200,000 job, working in the same seat, doing the exact same thing, next to all of the NCOs and soldiers that are thinking, what do I want to do for my career? And, and that's because as an institution, we didn't understand who it is that we're leading. But we did go back and fix that. So every instant we've had, every, but it takes every barrier. You can't predict. You can't say, look, if we don't do this, we're going to have this. Because everybody says, well, show me the empirical data. Well, it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. But trust me, it's going to happen. We had a staff sergeant tell the Secretary of Defense, after he impressed him to no end, he said, I'm glad you're on the team. He said, I'm getting out in six weeks, ETSing. And the SecDef said, well, that's too bad. Why is it? He said, sir, not only am I getting out, but me and everybody I know is getting out. And all of a sudden, everybody looks at me. <laughs> you know? And I said, hey, sir, I've been saying this, and nobody believes me. So we don't have empirical data. The people we just brought in to do this job are just hitting these windows. So we've got it figured out now if we want to keep them. So the good thing is, is every time we bring an issue or a challenge to the Army staff, they fix it. So where we're at right now is we're, gonna, we're, we're trying really hard. We're, we're excited we got a proponent on. We're excited we got things moving in the right direction. But there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So I guess I'm stopping there because Mike's over, over here <laughs> going to rip me off. So do we got time for any questions at all? One question. One question. Thank you, Sergeant Major. Uh, the question we have is, what do you see as the greatest challenge for the military to find and recruit the top 2%? Yeah, so the biggest challenge that we have is some of the institutional policies. Uh, so here's, here's an example. Uh, we had, and we're fixing, again, we're fixing some of these, but it's, to begin with, you find that top 2%. Turns out that a large majority of that top 2% is on the West Coast. So guess how many of the lieutenants that we just branched were from the West Coast? None. So when we go to talk to some of these industries, startup industries on the West Coast about you know, what it is that we want and what we're, we're trying to do, and they're briefing the boss, they're, they're telling him, hey, sir, every one of them, we sat down in a room with 11 different startup companies, some amazing young men and women doing some incredible things, and they started off with, I love to want to, we want to tell you what we're doing, we're doing great things, we're trying to change the world, but we're not going to work for the Department of Defense. It's just too hard. Uh, so we had a, we went to Google, and I talked to a young lady who is a, has a graduate degree from Berkeley, in computer science, she's working for Google. They have 150 people in line for every vacancy to interview. And she says, you know, I've got this skill. I want to go to, 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 to help the, the military uh, with my skill. So I'm going to go enlist. So she goes, or she, she goes to the recruiter and says, hey, I want to, I want to be an officer in the, uh, the Army Cyber uh, Force. And she has tattoos on her arms. And they, they said, you can't be an officer because you got tattoos. So you know what she is today? That recruiter put her in uh, as a number one man in the field artillery. Uh, she's out at you know, Fort Bliss or Fort Dix as a, as a field artilleryman. And then this is, this is what we're talking about. If you, wanna, if you wanna attract those kind of people, you have to create an organization first that tells them that they wanna be, that they wanna be in that organization. And what is it? Doesn't mean we have to have different standards. But it better mean that since we're not going to be, be able to pay them the same pay, we better be able to pay them enough that we take that decision off the table. So if we take that off the table, what's left is everything about organizational design, everything about organizational cultural change, everything about leadership that we think we know better be right. Because if it's not right, knowing that all we can do is get the money to a point to where it's not a consideration anymore, if we're going to get that right, 
then if we don't get that right, then we're not going to get that top 2%. And, and that's my, my job is to help try to convince uh, the, the folks at the Department of the Army to understand uh, here's why we're asking for what we're asking for because it's that important to get the right folks. So I guess that was my one question. That was our final question for Command Sergeant Major Harris. Please welcome to the stage Colonel Mike Wark, Vice President for Defense FC International. Uh, aren't you glad that you were in this class? It's a session. I'll tell you right now, I knew it was going to be what it was. And I'm also glad that you said what you said because we got a chance to see the top 1% up here today, and that was fantastic. Cool. Good job. Right. We, we will provide a... a uh, we will provide a uh, benefit you know, on behalf of the Wounded Warriors uh, for the presentation just uh, conducted by the good Command Sergeant Major. Now, we are going to move directly into the next phase. We're going to have our panel set up, so we'd like a, 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 literally a break in place. All we've got to do is put the name tags and get the panels on the stage, and we'll be ready to go. Uh, Command Sergeant Major Harris, thank you again for a fantastic presentation. And we have all the questions that were brought in. We just didn't have the time.